Okay, I'm here with Dr. Tom Smith. He's a professor in the wildlife and wildlands conservation um, uh, department at BYU, and he knows quite a bit about native edible plants in Utah, things that the pioneers um, would have eaten. Um, so I just have a few questions, and I, I'm going to have a conversation with him. Um, so, you know, as the pioneers entered Utah, um, what what plants would they have seen as edible, and what would they have kind of been able to gather and, and use? Well, I mean, they came from a culture where they routinely harvested off the landscape to begin with, so it wasn't like you or me trying to think, okay, what could they use here? They already knew many of these plants. There's a lot of plants that are unique to the Great Basin, but there's a lot of stuff that overlaps. And so they would have, um, they would have carried with them all that knowledge. And then also, as they interfaced with the locals, uh, the native tribes, the Ute and the, Pi the Paiute and different groups, they would have uh, also asked them for advice on certain things. We know they did a little bit, but they they experimented too. Um, and one thing's for sure, they were extraordinarily hungry people. Um, so it wasn't like a hobby like it is today. It was a matter of seeing you through to the next day. So they were uh, extraordinarily motivated to find these things. It will deliver so much protein, starch, and micronutrients per effort, uh, unit of effort than that. They knew that, they collected acorns. Um, people before them, uh, we go a little further west, that's where I see the best records, like the black oak. We don't have black oak here, but in California, they, get, they, they claim 500 pounds off a single tree. And when the earliest pioneers uh, or explorers came, Europeans came to the California coast, they saw great silos that were hand woven, suspended uh, from poles. They were like woven baskets that they loaded with acorns to keep them away from the rodents. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, wow. it was such, wow. I mean, that thing will, will, will see you through to the next spring. There's nothing else here that's going to do it like that. So the gamble oak that covers the whole place, that, that was heavily used. Mm. Um, then, of course, you've got cattails. They were extraordinarily familiar with cattails. Uh, it's been called the supermarket of the swamps. You can eat every part of that plant, uh, all the way down from the roots to the stalks, uh, up through the, uh, well, the stalks themselves. When I say stalk, we're talking like the male um, uh, reproductive part there that has the uh, pollen producing part in the spring they would clip all those off and you can they're kind of like little corn on the cob and they're quite tasty if mm -hmm. you if you roast those or boil them the um the uh, uh roots underground in the water if you pull those out and, and i've done this you clip them strip them and then you smash them they uh, a very very heavy white starch comes out of that it's quite tasty. You can make pancakes out of it, breads, all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was. I mean, there was a lot of stuff back east that they used. Any kind of leafy green that would come out emergent in the spring, like we're starting to see come out here. Violets. Uh, violets are native. Those were used in, in um, Britain uh, to make violet syrup, violet tea. They would use it as a fresh pot herb. You can pull the leaves off, steam it, eat it. It's very high in vitamin C. Um, you know, and actually, quite frankly, had they known the link between scurvy and vitamin C, they could have stopped all scurvy on sailing ships just simply by providing them dried violet. Mm. Um, wow. That would have done it. Um, similarly, the pine trees here, pinus, uh, well, we don't have strobilis up north, but the white pine. Um, then we have, or the, the one that produced the big pine seeds, uh, pinion pine, pine pinus edulis. Yeah. Um, the nuts are quite edible, but they also knew that the needles were made a, a very good tea, and it's extraordinarily rich in vitamin C. In fact, if you just chew on the needle, you taste mm. the ascorbic acid, which is uh, right, the, you know, uh, the component that carries the vitamin C. Yeah. And so they would steep that in hot water and drink that. Um, 
the a lot of the other plants you know like mullein stock that grows back east as well and it's here they didn't eat that one but they used it uh, for a lot of uh, medicinal purposes made salves uh, they would burn it and actually use it to inhale the because uh, you know a lot of a lot of chemicals are liberated when something's burnt yeah case in point tobacco marijuana those kind of things the the burning liberates them into the smoke and then the smoke inhaled you know puts them into the bloodstream and mm-hmm. they knew that with mullen and they would uh, uh, use it to for uh, a variety of ailments and it was effective um, they also knew the willow which we have the western willow species that don't grow back east but they're still willows and they knew that it's very bitter but if you've ever uh, well, anyway, if you taste the bark here, it's very bitter. That's salicylic acid, which is the willow family, uh, salicase. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And salicylic acid, named after the willow, is the active ingredient of aspirin. And they made um, a tincture of that, and it was extraordinarily mm. effective for dulling headaches and treating those. Would they have used, like, coyote willow? They would. They could, yeah, any of them. Or, yeah, just any. Okay. Any of them, you know. Yeah. Uh, we've got Gairai, the river one. We've got the, all these other ones. Mm-hmm. The other thing that they would have done that they brought from back east is they knew that tra- tapping maple trees produced the highest quality uh, sugar for the east, least amount of energy, well, gathering-wise. And so they carried yeah. uh, spiles. Uh, these guys were really smart, spiles being a, a spigot, a tap. Mm-hmm. They made them out of elderberry, which again is another plant that they extraordinarily exploited back east. They have the elderberry there as well, and here it grows abundantly. It dries. It's very sweet, very chewy. So any of the berries, the elderberry, the service berry, they would have gone for a pie in the mountains. The thimbleberry, which is Rubus parviflorus, which is the, um, the absolutely delicious raspberry. We have red raspberry. We've got strawberry. And the fact that it was used. As a tea, I've drank it. It's uh, I don't find it particularly good, but it is an herbal tea, Brigham tea they call it. Um, yeah. There's a whole pharmacopoeia of stuff in there too. I mean, heaven only knows what all is in there, mm. but we can look it up. It's it, but they knew it was a you know it was a different time. Their tastes were different. State flower seagull lily, which also was. Which was used by the pioneers. Yeah, supposedly well. helped yeah. them make it through their first winter <clears throat> because the Indians pointed out that the the little root about the size of a the diameter of a dime mm. is full of starches and when boiled is a, is pretty good. And yeah, I've dug them before, but again, it's a different it's economies of scale. You know, most uh, most of us wouldn't waste time, but if you have nothing but time and very little food, that becomes the focus. Yeah. So the seagull lily was very heavily used. The other thing that was really interesting, too, this isn't plants, but of course, if you go back in history, the Mormon cricket, which is neither a Mormon nor a cricket, the Katie <laughs> did, but those, they, they have recipes how to make pies out of them. They made uh, all kinds of things, because when you can get an animal whose abdomen is the size of my thumb, and that is all high energy dense high protein yeah. oh absolutely yeah. you're not going to pass uh-huh. that up you ain't going to pass that yeah up. and they didn't there was oh but there was of course the choke cherry and there was yeah. of course the oregon grape uh, mm. the oregon grape which most people wrinkle their nose that makes an absolutely splendid jelly but it also makes a good nutritious drink and mm. uh, they didn't pass that one up either and mm. back to goldenrod which is native uh, solidago nana I think it's the one here. I get confused with Alaska, but I think it's solid banana. That's very edible, quite good pot herb. So, yeah. so the other one, I remember I was hiking a slope up Spanish Fork Canyon, and there was the wild husk tomato there, Physalis. Uh, I don't can't remember the species off the top of my head, but um, it's the husk tomato. Well, that's a tomatilla, the same thing that's the size of a golf ball. That you grow um, in your garden. Yes, yeah. but these are the wild ones, and they are <laughs> unbelievably. Um, in the fall, bright yellow, sweet as candy. They're just lovely. Mm. They made uh, tomatilla. They used it in their, their salads. They made uh, preserves out of it. You didn't miss tomatilla. That was a very good one. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, so where did I go from? I think from from our conversation and from what I've talked to you in the past, mm. it just really seems like we walk out on the landscape today and we just don't see 
the same things because again how you've said they were hungry and they had enough time to forage and look for things but there was a wide range of nutrients like you talked about vitamin c from different things and they were able to oh they didn't miss subsist it. and live off of what they could find you know? yeah they brought from the yeah. from europe a very deep knowledge that goes clear mm-hmm. back to when they're when their ancestors were flint napping yeah. and making stone blades they didn't leave that behind and when they mm. came to the to the new world they recognized lots of plants that were familiar plus they learned from the locals the natives oh another one roos uh uh god i hate this plant uh the roos is here so we have roos aromatica well, we have one? aromatica, which is the mm-hmm. one of the ones that tortures me um, because I'm trying so hard to put out of my mind squaw bush, which is offensive to our local indigenous people. Um, it's also called skunk bush, but the red berries on that one and also what used to be called Roos trilobata. It's also called uh, Roos, oh God, it's got so many different names, but it's the staghorn sumac that has the big rhomboidal berry groups that grows all over the place. <clears throat> Yeah, these are phenomenal plants. Which, if the seed heads are collected, your hands are sticky with ascorbic acid. If you lick them, it's just so sour. It's not bad flavor. You put that in water, and it makes a spectacular lemonade. I mean, it's very good. So does so roos. Obviously, service berries huge. That's probably my favorite berry in the state. That's one berry that you can actually catch. You can actually harvest it as much as you want to eat and it's a lot because yeah. you know i don't know if you've eaten them dried they're just like absolute perfect snack they're like raisins um only they have a kind of almond flavor to them they're uh, tremendous sweets i've gathered service berries in wyoming mm. and made jam oh they're or jelly with them yeah we use them in muffins yeah. we just uh, love to eat them uh-huh. they're just good to eat fresh uh, yeah. dried you can use them like raisins and cereal and trail mix and and they did that here too yeah i've read a couple of accounts kind of people talking about what brigham young said to the pioneers and i think he counseled them to use sagebrush to make tea and but yeah thank you for yeah for having this discussion that guy never was done yeah that's okay This plant um, is known as Mormon tea. That's its common name. And the pioneers, when they came into um, Utah, gathered a lot of this plant and with these leaves, they're kind of like stem leaves. Well, they're the stems and there's little leaves on them. But with the green growing part of the stems, they boiled it in water and made what's known as Mormon tea. So I'm going to try to gather some of this and make some tea of my own out of it. Here I have my um, ingredients ready to make this Mormon tea. Uh, Most importantly, I have the... The, ban- the branches of the the ephedra plant that I've gathered, and they've been drying for a while, uh, but they're ready to go. I have some sugar. Pioneers may not have used sugar, but I add some sugar just to kind of give it, of course, that sweet taste combined with the Mormon tea tastes really good. So I have my pot filled about half full of water. I'll just uh, turn that on to kind of a medium high heat so I can, you know, get it started heating up. Uh, There's quite a bit of water in here. I don't know how much sugar. I don't want it too sweet, but I will, if you can see that. There's some uh, something burning on that burner. Anyways, this is gonna make quite a bit of tea, but uh, it's really plenty of sugar. 
So, just kind of keep that sugar in with the water as it's heating up. sit in there as well. So the way that I do it is just kind of clip off these green portions of the plant. Just do one. There we go. You just want to get, uh, you know, the the green stems down submerged in the water. And I have the tea uh, starting to boil here. Um, I've trimmed the Mormon tea plant into the water here and the water is heating up. I've added a little bit of sugar into the pot as well. And you can see the water is starting to steam and it's getting a little bit of that um, kind of rose color in it. So from here, I'm gonna put the lid, make sure all this stuff is kind of down in the water and put the lid on it and let it boil and then simmer for a while. And then I'll check on it in a, in a few minutes. The tea's been boiling now for about 15 minutes. Um, it was at a high boil and then a simmer and after that time it kind of turns this dark color so I'll dip oops I got a few branches there I can dip some of this out it kind of turns this dark purplish brown color And it's pretty hot right now, so I'm not going to take a sip, but I will in a few minutes and let you know how it tastes. Got my tea here, uh, cooled off a little bit, ready to drink. Mm. Yep, Mormon tea, there you have it.